If you would, please turn with me. I, I warned you last week that I had uh, several, several, several notes uh, for last week, and we only got through the first verse. So we're going to go back, Mark 1, uh, verse 6 through 8. And as we look there, uh, we're going to find, uh, once again, the talking of the ministry of John the Baptist. And really, uh, we're going to get to what was the gospel according to John the Baptist. Now, you may think of that and you may look and say, well, oh, well, there's only one gospel. Well, you're absolutely right. But we remember uh, Jesus saying that John was the last of the Old Testament prophets. So technically, according to what Jesus said, now the words are in red, what Jesus said, the Old Testament prophet means we're still in the Old Testament to an extent, right? So we're in that interlude between the two. Uh, but here we find that the Word of God says, Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. I indeed baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious and heavenly Father, I just come before you right now. Father, I ask that you would be with us here at this exact moment in time. Father, remove from us any and all of the distractions. Father, help us to see you for who you are. Father, don't let us think that we are mightier than you. Father, don't let us think of ourselves as worthy. Father, don't let us seek to be baptized in self instead of baptized in you. Father, now I ask that you would to bless us, draw us closer to you, and help us to see you for who you are. For it's your name we ask and humbly pray. Amen. I, I'll be honest, the first time that I really, really looked at this, did, did an in-depth study on this, was uh, well over a decade ago. And I remember as I tried to preach just a simple thought on this exact scripture, about halfway through, I lost my voice. And then I had a dear preacher friend of mine tell me, instead of trying to do it on your own, use one of these. <laughs> so, uh, as we look here, we're going to look at the gospel according to John the Baptist this morning. We need to understand, first off, that he didn't just preach a feel-good message. If you'll look in today's society, that's what a lot of people are looking for. They're looking for a feel-good message. They're looking for somebody to tell them how good they are, how awesome they are, instead of saying how uh, that we are nothing more than wretches that the song refers to. We find here in this that what John did is he preached Jesus. As he preached Jesus, he was basically showing us very simple thing. Number one is that it's not about the show. If you'll look in today's society, too many times what we do is we think that church is all about the show. We think it's uh, that, that hour that we're inside of a building or an auditorium or a sanctuary. That's what we think church is. Guys, it's not about the show. We looked at it before. Where is he preaching? In the wilderness. Where is he preaching? Beside the river. Why is he preaching? Because he's telling us that there's one mightier than him. You see, when we get away from it being about the show, when we get away from it being about the numbers, let's look at John. What, what could John have done if he had wanted to have a big crowd? Well, I can tell you, uh, here in a few short hours over in, I believe it's in Houston, uh, there's going to be this one uh, arena that people are going to go into. You know what they do to get into that arena so that they can uh, listen to somebody as he smiles and he blinks all the time? They're going to pay 30 bucks a piece to walk in the door. And they're going to fill that place up. And 
there's a huge number, so people automatically think, well, if there's a huge number, that must mean that what he's saying is true. And all it's really doing, and you should know this as well as I do, uh, that all that is happening is they are really being taken away uh, from the truth of the gospel. They're not talking about the blood. They're not talking about Christ. They're not showing them Jesus and him crucified. Why? Because it's all about the show and it's all about the numbers, guys. True gospel message is not about the show, and it's not about the numbers. We find also uh, that it's not about the aesthetics. It's not about the feelings. It's, it's really not about what the place looks like. It's not about, uh, did, I, did I feel a, a goose bump when they hit that uh, D chord on the piano? It's about Jesus Christ. The gospel is about Christ. Now, I was talking to a, a preacher friend of mine this past week, and he asked a simple question, and I really think that what he was doing uh, was he was fishing. You ever, you ever uh, go to somebody and they give you a question, you know they're fishing? When they're trying to either A, start an argument, or B, they're, uh, they're trying to act dumb so that you can hear uh, they can hear what you have to say. I want to give you the gospel. You ready? I want to give you exactly what the gospel is. And this is, even in the, in the very fact of John the Baptist, this is what Paul tells us. Now, when we look at these words, I, I want to give you this. Uh, these words there in 1 Corinthians 15, they are, uh, according to linguistics, according to people that study languages, these are the earliest recorded words about the gospel. Here you go. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15. Uh, we're going to look at verses 3 and 4. For I deliver to you, uh, first of all, that which I received. So here he goes. That, uh, that Christ died for our sins according to scriptures. Verse 4. And he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to scripture. So what do we find there? The gospel is not about how you can feel better. It's not a five-point message on how to balance your checkbook. It's not about uh, a ten-point message on why we should see this version or that version. No, the gospel is about Jesus Christ. It is about him crucified, him buried, and him rising again. As we look at that, we find that there is nothing else that can save. You can be born in the church building itself. You could have been in church since negative nine months old and never missed a Sunday, not one. You can know the scripture frontwards and backwards and sideways. But if you don't have Jesus Christ, if you don't have true belief in, on, through Jesus Christ, you do not have. Have the gospel. We find in this, we find in this that the gospel is the only thing that can free you. Let me say that again. The gospel is the only thing that can free you. Free me from what, preacher? Well, I'm glad you asked. Free you from everything. There are some that are, uh, that are gripped with uh, tradition. There are some that are gripped with uh, their, uh, their own past. There are some that are gripped with family. There are some gripped with blinders on their eyes. And what we must see, what we must understand is that this gospel, what it does is it frees us of all of that. That we can live life and life more abundantly in Jesus Christ alone. We find that this message was a simple message preached by a simple man. Why? Because that's all it takes. It takes us believing that he lived, he died, and he rose again. Now, when I was talking to this preacher friend of mine, 
earlier in the week. He was trying to add to it that, that we must believe in the Trinity. We must believe in a, in a young earth. That we must believe uh, in uh, what color hill book that we use, basically. None of that matters outside of Jesus Christ and Him crucified. So let's get to the message. All that in, uh, in uh, introduction. Let's get there. Okay. So we find here that he preached. What does that mean? He proclaimed the word of God. He was telling them, this is the truth. This is the way, the truth, and the life. And in that, uh, we find that what he said was, the first thing is, there comes one after me that is mightier than I. What does that mean? That simply means that he is mightier than me. How is he mightier than me? Well, number one, he's God, right? How many guys are going to argue on that one? He's God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you'll remember, uh, just a few verses down from here, uh, we've got oh, uh, oh, God himself uh, speaking audibly, saying, this is my Son, in whom I am well pleased. You've got him at the Mount of Transfiguration. Him saying, this is my son, listen to him. In all of this, we must understand that he is mightier than us. And being mightier than us, we must understand from there that what happens is he is the one that sustains us. He is the one that sustains me. And in that we find that he is the one that provides in your life, there are going to be things that you're going to need. I don't know about you, but all of us are going to need something. Uh, probably all of us need some food. If you're like me, you've had too much. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we find there are some things that God is going to need to provide for us. And in that, we need to understand that as He is mightier than us, He will sustain us and He will give us what we need. Now, we said a few weeks ago, we'll say again, uh, we do not need all of the, uh, the numbers to the, uh, to the Powerball. No, you don't need that. Uh, we don't need to have a, a Diablo. We don't need to have uh, a billion-dollar home. We don't need to have uh, a one with eight million zeros behind it in our checking account. We don't need those things. But what we need to understand is that He is mightier than us, that He will sustain us, in all of our needs. David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor begging of bread. What does that mean? If we are a child of God, God is going to provide a way for us to get exactly what we need. In this statement, we find that he abides. If you'll remember John 15, verses 5 through 7, we'll find over and over again, again, if you abide in me, I will abide in you, and together we will bear much fruit. How does that happen? How can that be unless we understand that being connected to him, that he is abiding in us and making changes in us, feeding us, giving us what we need as we see the sustainment of our Heavenly Father. How do you need to be sustained today? What is it that you need today? For some, it could be that you're struggling with something in your mind. For some of us, it could be that we have an idol that we would rather worship than worship the Lord. You know, when that happens, we know that there is a, a strange dichotomy that happens, that we know what to do, but yet we don't do it. Paul went through that, didn't he? Paul went through that, I know to do this, but yet I do that. I don't want to do that, but yet I want to do this, but it seems I can't seem to do that. You see, that's a struggle that you and I will struggle with until the day the Lord says, come on home. But it does not mean that you cannot gain victory through and of and for those things. Why? Because he abides. As a child of God, he abides in you. And if you are a child of God, and if you realize he is abiding in you, that means everything we do, everything we say, every place we go, all the things we don't do that we know we should do, guess who is there all of the time? 
the same one that abides. We find as he sustains us that he he revives us. I'm going to go over real quick to uh, Isaiah. In Isaiah, we find something that uh, the Lord uh, has penned in this book. Isaiah uh, 59, looking at verse 16. Uh, and there we find, got one more page to go over. Uh, we find there that the Bible says, And he saw there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Can I say that would be a bad place to be? When God's looking around, and there's nobody, there's not an intercessor. Therefore, his own arm brought salvation for him. And his own righteousness, and it sustained him. You see, you cannot do it on your own. There is no way that man can come to God outside of the Lord Jesus Christ with uh, two boards, three nails, and a bloody, bloody Savior. And in that fact, we can be revived. How can you be revived, preacher? Well, you can be revived because of something that is so beautiful. You ready for this? That even yet, while you were a sinner... Christ died for you. He knew all that you would do. He knew all your struggles. He knew all your failures. He all knew all your warts. He knew all your crankiness. He knew it all. But yet, what did he do? He still came to revive you. Why? Because he is mightier than me. How do you need to be revived today? Say, well, preacher, I'm going through uh, this time in my life. I'm really not sure what I should do. I'm going through this time in my life, and it seems there's nothing else that I can do. Well, let me tell you, what you need to do is simply go to the one that will sustain you. Go to the one that will be with you when nobody else will. Go to the one that will stick with you well, that is closer than a brother. Why? Because he's mightier than me. And in this we find that he will renew us. Now, as you look at that, I remember uh, automatically one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Anybody got favorite verses? One of mine is in Psalm 51, and that is, it says, Return to me the joy of thy salvation. Why does that matter? Because uh, to return the joy of the salvation of the Lord, that means that we must be purged, we must be cleansed. That means that he is doing the work in us that we can be renewed in him. There's nothing that you could do that God cannot forgive. If you don't believe me, just look at Brother Moses. Brother Moses was a murderer. Okay? Let's go a little bit further. How about Abraham? Abraham was an adulterer. I believe the Bible says that they're both been forgiven. How about you? Have you ever looked there? As we look, we continue to see uh, in this, this renewal, that is, we are renewed in Him. That means that we are satisfied in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as we look, we need to understand that in this satisfaction, uh, that it doesn't happen because simply we want it to. It happens as we get closer and closer to Jesus. Because He is mightier than me. We find in this too that as he renews us, what he does is he renews our mind. You go over to uh, Romans 12, verse 2. That's that transform, uh, transform uh, verse uh, we always use. But as you look there, he says that he will transform the mind. In other words, he will take our mind. He will take it from where we were. He will take us away from the things that we have uh, wanted and desired that we thought we needed through the flesh. And what he does is he renews us and he changes our mind to what we really need. Today, where is it that you need to be renewed? 
You see, we, we find that so many times what happens is that as we want, uh, we act like Faruka. How many of you guys ever watched Charlie and the Chocolate Factory? I think all of us, right? You remember uh, Faruka, she wanted it now and she wanted it right now. She didn't care who she hurt. She didn't care what anybody else had done. She didn't care about all the work that went into whatever it was. She wanted it right now. How many times are we the exact same way and we need to be renewed? As we need to be renewed, we need to understand he is mightier than us. And in being mightier than us, he holds us in the palm of his hand. Now, how is that? We need to understand that as he holds us, he holds us that we may know that he is God. I remember in my Bible, I don't know if you've ever read this, but over in, uh, in Exodus, you know, that's the Old Testament. A lot of people get afraid of the Old Testament. But in the Old Testament, there they are, and uh, they have uh, had, went through the walls of water. They're on the other side. And then all of a sudden, here comes down the water, destroys uh, Pharaoh's army, and we can go into that later. But, uh, but as we find all that, they sit there and they ponder, and then they are still, and they see the mighty work of God. David would go on to say, be still and know. How could he know? How can you know? You ever ask that question? How can you know? Other than the fact that you were held in the arms of Messiah. We find with that, that in that there is some assurance. Now, uh, in if you need to ever mark up a, a verse, here's a good verse to mark up. John 10, verse 28. Why? Because that's all the assurance that you need. For those the Father have given me, I have kept, and nothing will take them out of my hand. But here's the next question. How do you know whether you're in or not, preacher? What's your fruit? Where do you need that blessed assurance? We find he holds us in all of our ways. There is nowhere that God does not go with you. There is nowhere that the Lord is not. You can feel as if you're far away from Him. You can feel as if He's not there. But let me tell you, He is. And as we know that He is, we find that there is assurance in this very fact that no matter where we go, there is the Lord. For where do you right now need to be held? Well, preacher, I'm, I'm going through a, a, a health scare right now. I, do, I don't have, I don't have the, uh, that feeling of assurance. Pray to be held by God. I remember an old song when I was a little bitty kid. I, I, I love when we, we teach our kids those little songs because I still remember this one. Uh, and all of you will too. He's got the whole world in his hand you know what he does i love the next verse he's got you and me in his hand right now maybe you need to be held maybe right now you need just a little bit of love from the heavenly father can i tell you you're not going to find it by sitting back there in a pew. You're not going to find it in a bottle. You're not going to find it in the person sitting next to you. You're only going to find that true holding through the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the last part of this, if you would, with me. He says there, uh, he says, 
and there comes one that is mightier than I. So we looked at the very fact that he sustained us. We looked at the fact that he renews us. We've looked at the fact that he holds us. But here, this is the best one. You ready? The very fact of the matter is that he completes us. You ever feel like there's something missing? The fact of the matter is there was something missing. You'll remember going back to the garden, Genesis chapter 3. Uh, there we find that in Genesis chapter 3, uh, they see the fruit. Uh, it looks desirable. It's good for knowledge. So there we find he takes it. She bites it. And then she gives it to her husband who was with her. Guys, we are not off the hook. He ate and immediately their eyes were opened. They were ashamed for they knew they were naked. What, what happened? A piece of them went missing. Guess what that piece was? The peace of God. They lost that feeling of peace. Now, now when we get into sin, when we get into sin, we should not be at peace. We should not be at rest. As we look at that word complete in your in your Bible, the word is pleru. Pleru, it means to be made holy. It means to become sanctified. The best, one of the best places to understand this is, it means that we are now finished in Christ Jesus. Where is it maybe today you need to be completed? See, right now you are going through uh, just so much of the ramifications of life. You've gotten to the point where you're just simply existing. You're uh, simply just uh, reacting. Uh, you're not even thinking. All you're doing is uh, going from point A to point B, and you're not letting anything sink in. What you need to be is completed in Him. How can you be completed in Him? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to go over to Colossians. And Colossians chapter 2, uh, there you're going to find in the Word of God, verse 14. There the Word of God says, I'm going to go up to verse 13 and then read 14. And He delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed to us unto the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin. So what do we find there? We are complete because he has paid the price. He has paid the price with his blood that you can be completed. You'll look in Leviticus. I'm not going to ask you to go there, but in Leviticus 23, it's talking about the day of Pentecost being, uh, being uh, seven weeks after uh, we find Passover. Well, what happened on Passover? I know one thing happened in 32 AD. Anybody else know what that was? Christ died for you. Seven weeks later, Pentecost happens. The Holy Spirit falls down upon everybody, and as it falls down upon them, they are changed forevermore. But we are completed by His offering. If it had not been for the cross, there would not be you here in this room. He completes us in himself. Still Colossians chapter 2. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, looking at verse 10. Uh, For you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. So what do we find? We are only completed in Christ Jesus. You can read all the self-help books you want. You can go to all the shrinks and uh, the doctors you want. You can do everything that you think you can do. But until you're complete in Christ Jesus, you'll never be right. In that, what he does is he drives us to serve him. Uh, Colossians 4 and 12, uh, we find, Who is uh, one of you and the bondservant of Christ? Greet you, always labor, uh, laboring reverently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in his will. So what do we find there? That we are to, as we are being made complete, that then we will serve him. 
how many people, how many people only serve because they get something out of it? How many people say, well, Jesus, that wasn't in the fine print when I signed. If you're going to be made complete, you're going to serve him because you love him, not because of the things you get from it. So I'm going to ask a few questions and we'll be done. Number one, what is driving you to serve? If he's mightier than us, then what we should be driven by is our love for Christ. You see, we can run from it for a while, but eventually our rebellion will break us. You ever seen somebody you knew that was in an open act of rebellion? What eventually happens? They get broke. Do we need to be broken so that we can serve? We can try to deny it. Yet, when we get into the will of, his, of the Lord, we will be made complete. Because he is mightier than us. Guys, right now, he is worthy. How many of us right now just simply need to bow our heads and cry out, Abba, Father? And to say, Lord, here I am. Lord, I need you to complete me. Lord, I need to be renewed in you. Lord, I don't know what's wrong, but I know something is. I'm not leaving until you bless me. See, there's one coming that was mightier than John. That one is Jesus Christ. There is one here today that is mightier than you. And that one is Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Dear Lord, most gracious Heavenly Father, as we come before you right now. Father, I just want to praise you. I want to thank you. Father, right now, as we have our eyes and our hearts bowed before you, Father, I ask that you would let us be real. Father, let us be real that we could come before you and realize that you are mighty. Let us realize that you are worthy. Father, right now, as as we're eyes are closed speak to us O Lord Father renew the joy of our salvation Father let us live in your completed work and strive to serve you in all that we do For it's your name we ask and that we humbly pray. Amen.